the subject of time. This is my first visit, actually, for uh, 20 years now, so I think it might be my 20th anniversary visit. <laughs> was anybody around the last time I came? Hands up was around. Oh, we have a few survivors. <laughs> it's great. So, um, I think uh, the topic tonight, the focus tonight, is, uh, is probably what I would, I would uh, call the third most popular topic in the world. You all know the first two intimately. The first uh, most popular topic is, uh, is something called happiness. Yeah. And if you uh, review all your cappuccino conversations, you usually find that you've been talking about things related to either your happiness or your unhappiness. <laughs> People, objects, situations, etc. And then the second most uh, uh, popular topic is, uh, is perhaps the one we think about the most. Maybe not talk about, but yeah, we talk about it quite a lot. And that's love. Yeah. And uh, that's in the context of our relationships. And whether they're working or not working, and why they're not working, and why they don't love me, and why do I love them, etc., etc. And then the third most popular topic, the one that actually uh, causes all the stress, <laughs> is time. <laughs> and uh, I think that's why the most popular seminar in the world, I don't know if you have them here, is something called time management. And you tend to find that uh, they are the most densely populated uh, gatherings in just about every major city in the world now. But what's happened uh, in our understanding of time is, uh, well, I don't know, maybe you carry one of the three most popular illusions. And sometimes you hear yourself say it, but you don't realize you're under an illusion. And uh, the first illusion is, um, if we hurry, we will save time. Does anyone ever hear save time? Hands up those here who believe they've saved time. <laughs> and if you did, where is it? <laughs> I want to know. Where did you save it? Where did you put it? And the second illusion is if we do this tomorrow, there will be more time. Yeah. And have you ever noticed there's more time the next day than there was in that day. Don't think so. And then the third illusion is uh, if we um, if we uh, 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 what was the third illusion? I think I've actually forgotten what the third illusion was. The third is save time. Oh yes, quick hurry. Time is running out. <laughs> Have you ever seen time leave? Where did it go? Did it run? Did it walk? Did it stroll? And of course, time never runs out. And uh, I think the reason why we carry these three illusions goes back a long time in history. Uh, let me tell you a little story. Once upon a time, <laughs> there was a man in the mountains. Actually, he lived at the foot of the mountains in a little wooden cabin. And one day, he took this um, beautiful box, and on the box was painted a face and two arms. He took this beautiful box he'd spent a long time preparing, high up into the mountains. And at midnight, he whispered to time, and he said to time, if you come in this box, you will rule the world. And time whispered back, are you sure? And the guy said, yep, if you enter this box and come back down the mountain with me, you will be the ruler of the world. And so time decided, yes, okay, I'll do that. And so time entered the box, and the man brought this beautiful box with a beautiful face and two perfect arms back down the mountain to his little wooden hut, and he put the box up on a shelf, and he called that box a clock. <laughs> and that was the entry of the first clock into the world. And from that point onwards, 
people would learn to look at the clock as if they were watching the passing of time. Don't we do that hundreds of times every day? We look at our watch and at a clock more often actually than we do other people. We have a more intimate relationship with our little machines than we do with other people. And what happened when we invented the clock, this fantastic machine, is that we were able to begin to measure the space between events. And that's what our sense of time is. It's just our attempt to measure the space between events or how long it takes an event to happen. Yeah. And as soon as we started thinking, we could measure the speed of an event and we could make the event happen faster that was the moment we began to believe, ah, we know how to control time. But we weren't really, we're just controlling the event. You understand? But then we fall under the illusion that I'm controlling time, I'm making things shorter. And we began to believe we were the masters of time. But we weren't. Masters of clocks and watches, perhaps because we created them, but not the masters of time. And that's why there is no such thing as time management. Time management is an oxymoron. Do you all know what an oxymoron is? <laughs> it's like a contradiction in terms. You've heard of holy war? Yeah. How can a war ever be holy? Yeah. Military intelligence? How can the military ever be intelligent? Oh, what did he say? <laughs> emotional intelligence? Have you ever noticed? Whenever you're emotional, you are not intelligent. Never noticed? That's why it's an oxymoron. Because it's impossible to manage time. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're really trying to measure the space between events. And, and, and so... When we believe that we're controlling time, we're making things faster, quicker, slicker, that means is that we start believing we're controlling events. We're controlling the actions of others. And this is where our stress comes from. Because in our consciousness, have you ever had that thought? They should be doing this faster. They should be doing this more efficiently. They should be doing this quicker. They must do this differently. Have you ever had those thoughts occur? Never. No. And when those thoughts arise, it means you're trying to control what you can never control, which is other people. Or actually any event more than three and a half feet from you. It's impossible to control anything. But when you try to control, you are destined to eventually fail. And that's where the stress comes from. What is stress? Anxiety, sadness, anger, irritation. Why are you not doing what I want? Why are they not doing what I want? Why are you not giving me what I want fast enough? Why is the service around here not quicker? Why are you so inefficient in what you're doing? You know those little thoughts? Those thoughts means I'm making my stress, my stress for myself. Because that's what stress is. Anxiety, irritation, frustration, upsetness. Do you see it? So the secret to be stress-free is to stop trying to control anyone or anything else. Simple, eh? <laughs> yeah, that's the secret. Stop trying to control anyone or anything else. Stop trying to control the speed but today that's not easy because today speed is our modern god. Is that right? Don't we worship speed today? Don't we teach our new generation to worship speed? If the new iPad, iPod, knee pad, head pad or whatever pad it is is not faster, slicker, more efficient than the last model, then it's not worth having. You can't have that. You can't take that in front of your friends. Because what will they say? Oh, you've got the old model there. It's much slower than mine. You haven't got the new one? Oh, it's so quick. Oh, you should have one of these. It's so fast and sleek and efficient. And then we start 
inside going, oh my goodness, I'm behind the times. I'm behind the times. Do you see? It's just riddled with illusions. Riddled with illusions. So the secret is, can I stop trying to control anyone and anything else? Can I step back and not be ruled by, literally ruled by, tyrannized by, speed? Yeah. This is why there's a whole movement in the world now called the slow movement. I don't know if any, any members are here tonight. And the slow movement, they've kind of raised the flag, the anti-speed flag. And they say, come on now, eat slowly, walk slowly, read slowly, talk slowly, go to the bathroom very slowly. <laughs> Do everything slowly. Yeah. But that's why you come here, isn't it? Because here everything kind of slows down. Do you get that sense? Yeah, it's, it's because meditation happens here. People meditate here a lot. And when you meditate, then it's like you're stepping back from the frenetic pace of the changing, speedy world around you. You're kind of stepping back. And you're stepping back towards your timelessness. Yeah. So there's three, four kinds of time, actually. It's four kinds of time. Yeah clock time, which we've kind of talked about, which is what we all tend to believe is time, but clocks, they don't contain time, they just are efficient ways to measure the speed of change, movement, basically. And then there's natural time. Do you all know what natural time is? The time that you find in, excuse me, one second. Okay, thank you. <laughs> this is attachment, by the way. Yeah. So in India, it's called bhakti. <laughs> so then there's natural time, the time you find in nature, the rhythm of nature. You all know the rhythm of nature when you go out into the countryside and there's this very deep connection with just the way things move and change. You know, they, they say that the real time, true time, oh, here we go again. One, oh, no, smile. Everybody smile for the camera. Look this way. Yeah, there we are. Oh, plays a tune as well. Isn't that fantastic? It's entertaining. You got, can you sing too with it? Yeah. Ding, 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 ding. There we go. Wow. Oh, it's a pleasure. Anytime. Where's the music? Oh, the music's coming from there. Whose is this? Yeah, I'm going to start dancing if you leave this here. Whose is this? Light one? Yeah, but I'd rather be recorded without the music playing on the background if that's okay. Yeah. See? See? That's, it. that's great. Thanks very much. <laughs> Good. So all I need to do now is sing, is that right? Shall I sing now? <laughs> so this is the second kind of time, is natural time, the time of nature. And they say that the true time in the world, uh, the most natural time, real time, is the speed of a cow. The speed of a cow. Yeah. Just think about the speed of a cow. Don't you automatically go, Ah, yeah, we need to think of that. But then if you notice when you look out into nature, then time, which is really defined by change, by events which are change, you'll notice that all events, all change in nature, they don't go along, they go round. Yeah, they're cyclical. Yeah, nature works cyclically, the seasons of the year, obviously. Yeah, the, the what else? Is the, there's the water cycle and the what else? Carbon cycle. Everything moves and changes and shifts. Signals it's, it's, it's cyclically. 
So there's this lovely idea of everything returning, everything coming back, everything moving around. And as soon as you grasp that idea, then you kind of surrender to trying to control, trying to fix, trying to straighten out, trying to... F Do you ever... Anyone have gardens here? Anyone, anyone have garden, garden, you, any gardeners? You know the gardens always have a laugh at people who garden. They spend their whole lives in the garden trying to sort things out, straighten the grass and the flowers. And they're always cutting and shaping. Oh, look at everything that's dead right. And then one storm comes in or they, they miss a few weeks of gardening and guess what? Chaos reigns. Chaos reigns supreme. Yeah, Because we're trying to control the natural world. We're trying to fix it, sort it, straighten it out. But it doesn't work like that. It doesn't move like that. It moves in a natural rhythm, its own natural rhythm. What is it? Birth, growth, decay, and back again. Yeah. So the good gardener is the one who falls in harmony with that cycle, who works in harmony with that cycle, who's in that rhythm. And that's why therapy for many people, for many people, especially city dwellers, <laughs> Who are the city dwellers here? Therapy is going out to the country for a day. Have you not had that feeling? As if you've just gone, ah, slowed right down, and you're very relaxed, and then you wonder, why do I only do this once a year? <laughs> so the rhythms of nature, they show us the natural movement, the natural passing of time. And then, of course, there's psychological time. And psychological time is, well, do you all know someone who's always in a hurry? They've always got something to do. They're always busy. Time is always running out. Got to get on. Quick. Hurry, hurry, hurry. And you wonder if they're on something. You know? What are they taking? Because they're just going so fast. They cannot stop. In fact, they're probably what's called action addicts. Yeah? Rushaholics, basically. Rushaholics. And they never stop. They don't know how to stop. Until they come here, of course. Here you stop. Yeah, I'm sure that's why many of you come back here. Because you sense this is a place to just stop and go, ah, yeah. But then there's other people on the other end of the psychological time spectrum. And they seem to take ages to do everything. And they're only doing one thing at a time, and they're so slow. And you're in your head going, come on, hurry up, will you? What are you doing? What are you doing? You're going on and on. Stop it. Get on with it. You all know that person? <laughs> so this is because everyone's perception is different. And, and that's what makes us all unique. If we all had the same perception of life, events, the way things are happening, then we'd all be clones, basically. But we all perceive differently. And um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if you've ever noticed that, that um, time and events are like a sentence. Yeah, it's going, going a little bit deeper now. See if this works for you. You know in a sentence, you have punctuation. Full stops, commas, exclamation marks, etc. Now, if you didn't have the punctuation in the sentence, the sentence would begin to lose its meaning. It would lose its meaning. It would just be a whole row of words and all jumbled up, and we'd be a bit confused as we try to read it and give it meaning. So, events in the world are like the punctuation mark in the time of our life. Yeah. And everything is an event. Everyone is an event. Every event you go to, tonight is an event. Every event in the world is coming to you from outside in. It's a form of stimulation. Yeah, It's coming from outside in. And I don't know if you've noticed in the past, even the past 20 or 30 years, the speed of events is becoming exponential, faster and faster and faster. In fact, the whole new generation is coming through today, and they really are addicted to the speed of events. Stimulate me, stimulate me, stimulate me, stimulate me. 
And this is the generation, I'm sure there's no one here tonight, that has a very deep attachment to their technological toys. Because when you look at a screen, what are you looking at? Events. Another event, that's another event, something else, that's going on, something else, going on, it's going on, it's going on, it's going on. Or, have you noticed what happens when your screen on your computer freezes? You know when it freezes? What happens to your teeth? <laughs> you start going, oh, come on. And this is the sign that I'm not getting my hit of event. I'm not getting my stimulation. Got it? So, <clears throat> think of the time of your life as the sentence, and the punctuation marks are events, encounters with people, encounters with nature, encounters with what you have to do, maybe. Yeah. And actually, it's the space between the events, like the space between the punctuation, that contains the meaning of the sentence. And so it's the space between the events that you get the chance to create meaning. Every human being is a creator of meaningfulness. It's like the deepest nourishment, the deepest juice in our life when we create meaning for ourselves. No one creates it for us. That's why you can have two people look at the same situation or two people sitting considering the same idea and they have a different perception, a different meaning for what's going on. This is our individual job to create meaning in our life. Now, if you are addicted to speed, which means you like lots and lots of events, and you become dependent on stimulation, 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 then you're actually shutting down, closing the space in which you get the chance to make meaning on the inside. Do you get it? And that's what's happened in the world today. This is why people tend to live much more superficial lives, talk about more superficial things, think about more superficial things, because we don't give ourselves the space to reflect and find what's the meaning for me? What's the meaning of what just happened? What's the meaning that I can take from? What's the juice that I can take from this conversation, this relationship, this... Do you get it? And so if I'm not doing that, I'm not nourishing myself from the inside. And that's where our nourishment comes from. Not from the stimulation of the world around us, it has to come from inside. And that's why in the past 30, 40 years, the age of burnout has come down. Yeah, it used to be 45, 40. Now it's 25, 20 in many cities. Why? Because our energy is totally consumed by event, event, stimulation, 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 click, click, clickety clock, where's my mouse, where's the clock, here we go, give me more, I can't sit still, I've got to go. Get it? Yeah. That's why there's a whole generation growing up today with a more intimate relationship to technology than they do with other people. Yeah. And it's challenging, it's challenging. So, psychological time is giving myself the inner space. Time and space come together in consciousness. Giving myself the space to go deeply, to reflect, to contemplate, and find the juice of my own meaning, my own meaningfulness. If I don't, that I'm not nourished, and I kind of shrivel inside. And a sign of someone shriveling, fall asleep. Yeah. Or they're very impatient with everything. Yeah. And then the fourth kind of time is spiritual time. And spiritual time actually is... Um, well, it's a bit of a paradox, really. Spiritual time isn't time. <laughs> it's the space, the inner space, 
which we all have, which is beyond time. It's the inner space in our own consciousness where there's no change, no movement, no stimulation. It's the core of our being. Yeah. And that's where we know our own timelessness. It's where I can go beyond time. And that's where I find the deepest meaning. And that's why, I guess, for 2,000 years, the most popular, I don't know if popular is the right word, but the most um, frequent spiritual practices have been meditation, contemplation, self-reflection, giving myself a chance to touch, to be in that space inside, which is not subject to change or any movement. And that space is always there. Yeah. And when you taste that, when you live from that timeless space, that's when you know you are timeless. Some people call it being eternal. Some people just call it being beyond time. But when you've touched that, then you look at the superficial movement of time, event, and change and movement very differently. You see it in a different light. It ceases to overpower you. It ceases to suck you in like it did before. You cease to get carried away by events and the outer stimulations of the world. And you bring to everything you do a different energy, a different space. <laughs> so, what I'd like to do now is um, challenge you a little bit to challenge you a little bit I'd like I'd like you to get together with two other people and I'd like you to share in your small group what have been the two most interesting ideas that you've heard tonight for you yeah just two most interesting things for you or if not two one will do okay and then just share that amongst yourself as the group because then you engage with and they don't just float through. The ideas don't just float through. When you engage with it, it'll stay with you after the evening. And then your second task as a group is to think of one question, something that's not clear that you'd like to ask me. In other words, one question to give Mike George a hard time. Got the task? Clear? Two other people, not four, not two, three's best. Hello, how are you? Good evening, my name is, your name is, how are you doing? Do you speak to each other in Nairobi? Do you do that? Do you talk to each other? Yeah? Yeah, fantastic. So what, what was really most interesting for you tonight? What was the main thing that you got from that very quick talk tonight? Do you want to do that? Hello, how are you? I am, you are. Don't be shy. Everyone's a friend. It's good. Okay. It's all gone quiet. So, hands up those who started arguing. <laughs> Thank you. One honest chap in the front here. So, any questions? What are the questions? What's the question you were coming up with as a group? Just stick your hand up and uh, shout the question and I'll repeat it. This gentleman here? Yeah. So how to experience natural time in the city when you're far away from the country and, and nature. Uh, the fastest way is to put pl pot plants in your office. <laughs> that was a joke. I mean, that would help, really. And that's why, again, um, any greenery around you is a form of therapy. But um, I, I think the, the, the divorce, the nature of the divorce that we've made from the natural world by living in this concrete 
jungle, if you like, which it is now in the city, uh, uh, we just have to be prepared to make the stand or the decision for ourselves, to take ourselves away from it, to take us back into nature as often as we can. You know, and, and then when you're in the jungle, is to stop when you can and just reconnect with the natural rhythm of your being because your being is more connected to the natural world than to the concrete world. And that's why the, one of the practices that um, the BKs share all over the world is something called traffic control. And that's stopping three, four times a day, just for two minutes at a certain time, if you can, if you're not doing anything else. And then just having a moment of meditation. Slow the thoughts down, reconnect with your rhythm, uh, refocus your energy. And so little exercises like that, they help. Um, otherwise, yeah, a few pot plants will help as well. <laughs> it's good, yes. Um, I think ours is closely related to that as well. Yeah. How do we quickly unlearn our own habits of being a bit busy with the clock time and you know, trying to always be in a hurry? Yes. How do we break our addiction to clock time and rush, rush, rush and restore our awareness of spiritual time? Yeah, uh, the simple answer is come here more often. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's really a personal question of um, how much do I recognize that I am in rush mode? and that I am wasting my energy, and I am getting tired, and that this is unnatural. See, for, for many people, they're ready to think and make decisions along those lines. For other people, the addiction to action is so great. You know, it's just they're loving every minute. <gasps> change, change, stimulation, stimulation, stimulation. And so they're just not ready to make that move. So it's very personal. And um, again, it's a similar answer. You know, it's your own priorities, your own um, level of interest, your own desire to get back to your own natural spiritual state. A little bit like, you know, if you've spent 20 years in the city and you go out for the country for a day and you taste the countryside again, you taste that natural rhythm, you think, wow, 20 years, I need to get back here more often. And then they decide to take every second weekend or whatever. When you come here and you taste your own natural spiritual rhythm. And you go, wow, there's some another energy here. I need to tap into this. And so you make the decision to prioritize how you use your time from that moment onwards. You come here one night a week, half a day a week, or two times, or whatever. It's, up, almost, it's always up to you. But this is an oasis to do that, for sure. Definitely to do that. Yes, just here. Yes. You actually affect other people. You do affect other people, yeah. So yeah. How do you put that in the context of So how do you look at punctuality in the context of other people? Well, if you've made a commitment to someone to do something by a certain clock time, we've both agreed that by three o'clock I'll get the job done, then it's your responsibility to keep that commitment. It's not wrong, it's not right, it's just a responsibility that you've created, this is creativity, and that you have a commitment now to keep it. And if you don't, then you know it will affect the other. But you have to remember that if the other is upset, the other is stressed, you're not responsible for their upsetness. You're not responsible for their stress. <laughs> if you don't meet the deadline that you've committed to, and they get upset, you're not responsible for their upsetness. They are. Yeah, just like you're responsible if you get upset and someone doesn't meet a deadline for you. You know those moments when you get uptight? They're not creating your uptightness, your irritation, your frustration. That's what you're doing. So then you have to look at how you're responding to the event. Sound effects are going well here tonight. It's very good. One more time, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Thanks a lot.
Yeah, but not right now, thank you. Yeah. It's uh Thank you. Well said. So what? Yes. Yes. You're right. Okay. You're responsible to do it by seven o'clock if you've said you'll do it by seven o'clock, yeah. Reach at nine o'clock in the morning at the office, yes. Yes. Eleven o'clock, yes. And now let's say you reach at eleven. I'm just repeating so everyone hear the questions. Yes, okay. Okay. No, you've not not managed your time. You've just not kept your commitment to be there at nine. You, you signed up to do the job, and the signing up was I'll be at nine o'clock starting in the morning. And so you don't roll. You say roll up at eleven because I went to that seminar with Mike George the other night there, and he just said, "Hey, relax, take it easy." So I'm following his instructions. No, can't do that. Sorry, you have made a commitment to do the nine o'clock to five o'clock thing. So you have to keep that commitment. And if you don't, then there are repercussions, obviously. Yeah, in the context of your workplace, number one, and also in the context of your consciousness. Your conscience will tell you. I've broken a commitment in a relationship with someone. Now some people's conscience is very clear and they, they don't like that happening and so they make sure they're at nine. Other people kill their conscience and they go, oh well, I don't care. <laughs> and then there's further repercussions for that. Like, like, you yeah, you're not managing time. You don't manage time like I manage a box of apples on the table or a, I manage the cooking of the meal. I don't manage the time. What I'm doing is I'm, is I'm um, managing the event, the events. But then I'm not managing the events because I can't control events. So what am I doing? I'm managing change because events are just forms of change. But then you can't control change, so you can't manage change. All you can do is manage your response to change. That I have control over. Not the change or the event, but how I respond. And so that's why it's self-management. So time management is... event management is change management, is response management, is really self-management. That's all you can control, is yourself. Do you get it? So there's no such thing as time management, there's no such thing as event management, there's no such thing as change management. But you don't manage it and as a, like control it. All you can do is control your responses to it. See, I'm breaking the illusion of time management. Thanks, great question, yes. Time in a spiritual state. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. So you know, can we do it spiritually or is it all mutually exclusive? Um no. Uh you can't be addicted to spiritual time because it isn't time. There is no time in a purely spiritual state. Yeah. It's, it's not possible to be addicted to it. It's not a stimulant as such. It's coming from inside out. It's a state that arises from inside out, not coming from outside in. It's not a thing that's pressured onto you. So you, so you yeah, go on. Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, if we carry all our responses Yes. Yeah, so the, the, the question is, can we carry on our day-to-day -day responses in our day-to-day -day life without feeling that pressure? Uh, yes, it's possible, and that's why we're here. That's exactly why this place exists, to help people unlearn 
what they've put in the way of being able to do that. Yeah. In other words, we come here to reconnect with that timeless inner space that we all contain. And what that's also called is our power. This is where our power comes from. And when you're coming from that inner space with that power, then you look at the world very differently. You respond to people and events very differently. Yeah. In other words, you don't rush, you don't hurry. Yes, the deadline is four o'clock. I'm going to do my best to get there by four. And I think I can by the things I look at it now. Instead of going, oh my God, deadline's four o'clock. Oh, it's terrible. Is that awful? And I lose control of my thoughts, my feelings. I lose control of all the things I have to create in here. No, I'm standing in my power. And so I'm going to do things powerfully between here and four. So this is two different responses. Because in this one, I'm coming from my unchanging state, creating the right thoughts, the right feelings, the right decisions as I move forward. From here I'm coming, oh my God, it's terrible. I'm imagining four o'clock and I miss the day. What will they think? What will they say? Oh God, it's terrible. I'm so stressed. I'm so anxious. And so I'm not living from this spiritual state. I'm living from a more material state. If that's the best way to say it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. So, we've talked about um, situations of self-management. Yeah. I'd just like to uh, ask about um, a situation where we're working, working in a corporate office and uh, I have a team to manage. Yes. And uh, I have deadlines to uh, meet with the team and I ultimately report to a boss. Yes. So, how would I uh, manage time and people in that kind of a situation? Um, Yes. <laughs> Just a short question, that one. Um, again, it's this word manage that throws us off, you know. Manage implies control. And for 200 years, managers have been taught, manage your people, control your people, coordinate your people, organize your people, fix your people. And these are all implying that you can control people. But you can't. It's impossible. But if you're carrying the belief that you can, then when they don't do what you want them or you think they should do, then when they don't, you make yourself very upset. And then people are going, oh, get this lady out of my face. Yeah, she's always reacting. And then you lose your people in a sense. So the secret is to make the shift between control into influence. When you really get, I can't control anyone, my children, my family, my colleagues, my boss, when you really get that, you realize, but I can influence. Now, what are the best ways to influence people? And without getting into a whole seminar, then the foundation of influence is something called respect. Yeah, it's usually the first thing to go and the last thing to come back. Yeah, yeah. especially when we live under the illusion that we can control what we can't control. So as to always respect people, no matter whether they meet the deadline, miss the deadline, do a good job, do a bad job, never lose your respect for the other person. And then you're always able to have an influence. But be careful, it's very easy to go across the line into control. <laughs> How do you know the difference? If I ask you to do something and you don't do it, by four o'clock, I get upset. Therefore, I'm trying to control. But if you don't do it by four o'clock, and I know I can control you, I won't get upset. What will I say? Was there a problem? Was there something in the way? And do you need more time? Did I not say something clearly? In other words, I'll seek to understand. Yeah, And that's the second foundation of relationships. And in fact, the enlightened leader, basically. Respect and understanding. Respect and understanding. Challenge. It's challenging. Yeah. It's a great oh, thank question. Thank you. That was awesome. Yeah. Anyone else? Just here? Uh, my name is Jay. Yes, I'm a super close with Mr. Ram. Time, connection with the wife, the activities that you do. Yes. Time and connection with the activities that you do, yeah. The wife, the wife. Like now, the statement is said, time is money. Time is money. So now, how do you connect the two? How, what? How, uh, what is the connection between, between the, two? the usage of time yes. with the creation of the uh, world rewards like money? Yes. Some school of thought talk about those who spend their time well, 
they become more wealthier. Yes. Those who do not spend their time well, they do become wealthy. So I don't know whether there's a connection between the two. Uh, yes. It's not that time is money. It's that um, time is just how you use your attention, how you use your energy. Yeah. And, and so how you use your attention and your energy is a creative process. Yeah. And the problem with the mindset that time is money is that very often, not always, but most of them, they're not very creative. They just think money, 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 give me the money, give me the money. Yeah, how much can I charge for this amount of time, time, time? So money, time, money, time. And so in their life, the juice is going to be a lot less because the juice in our life doesn't come from the material from outside in. The juice in our life comes from inside out, from the creative process that starts in our consciousness. And that's why you, you get the happiest people who don't make much money, but they do very creative things. And, and they'll, 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 they don't care about money so much. I don't, I don't mind the money. I don't want, want money. I really have joy in what I'm doing. So you have to decide you know, which, and which side you want to go on, and, and ultimately, and, and that will come down to what is success for you. But to say money is time, doesn't work for me. Doesn't work. So if we've, if I've reduced my life to that, then no juice. <laughs> if that makes, does that make sense? Can you see it? Yeah. So there's a difference between hedonistic happiness and eudonistic happiness. Hedonistic happiness is pleasure, and so it comes from outside in. Eudonistic happiness is that feeling of significance, of meaningfulness, when you do something from inside out for someone else. So they're like the opposite end of the spectrum, except they're not opposite. It's good. Anyone else? Yes. Here, here. Yeah. We all have different meanings for what is respect. When you have agreements about what you want to communicate. But um, the, the meaning the meaning is very different for both yeah. parties. Yes. And then, of course, there's an expectation that's a form of control because it's expecting the other yeah, person to right. live up to your meaning. So how do you find a way to, to create shared meaning or you know, how do you get out of that um, kind of situation where it might be a positive thing, right? Yeah. It might be even that we have an agreement about being positive to each other. Yeah. But even the <laughs> meaning of what, what is positive, positive, what kind of language is positive, is yes. different for each person. Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, the key word is expectation there. And so um, this is what kills respect, as we expect. So see, as soon as you expect someone something from someone and they don't live up to it, that might be your definition, your meaning of respect, then we tend to make ourselves upset and then we withdraw our respect. And if you withdraw the respect, they withdraw their respect, whatever that meaning was, and suddenly the relationship has to be repaired. So the secret is, the, the answer for me is, is in your question, in, in a sense that we know that everyone has a different meaning of respect. So don't expect them to have the same meaning. And so if you don't expect them to have the same meaning, you can continue to respect them as they are. Now then, what kicks in is the law of reciprocity. Over time, if you respect someone anyway, it will come back, it will be returned. And there won't be an intellectual definition of meaning or whatever about it. It just will be returned in their actions, their attitude, etc. But at this point, I have to say, I haven't said it tonight so far, you mustn't believe a word I say. You have to see for yourself, experiment for yourself, really. And that's what relationship is, it's a laboratory in its own. Yeah. It's good. Here and then here. Yeah. I think you don't think you're switched on actually. No. That's it. <laughs> As you said, we can't control, push, or stop the time. Yeah. So, how to walk uh. with time? How to walk with time? Walk with time. Walk. 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 
Walk. Walking. You mean two legs, feet, walking. Uh, yes. How uh, go walk for a, with time? Go for a walk. <laughs> Don't understand. Don't run, walk. What do you mean how to walk with time? I don't understand. Be with time, in time. No, she's saying walk as in walking, right? Oh, work. Did you say work? No. Yeah, she, yeah, she does. She's going like this. <laughs> okay, okay, no, it, okay. Look, ultimately, time is not something separate. Time, you are time. Time is created in consciousness. Yeah, that's why psychological time is the closest to spiritual time, which isn't. Spiritual time is timeless. It's a loss of awareness of change, in other words, it's, it's okay. But psychological time, the person who does things very slowly, so time moves very slowly for them. The person's always speeding up, speeding up, speeding up. Time moves very quickly for them. So wait a minute, where is time? It's not something outside. It's in their perception. It's in their consciousness. So we are the creators of time. So when you walk with time, you're walking with yourself. Except you can't walk with yourself because it's the self that's walking. Do you get it? Just walk. Just walk. Thank <laughs> you. Maybe I'll give you an appointment for every hour, different groups. And the first group doesn't keep my time. Yes. I am already late for the group. So what is the best way to sort it out? Break the second group or break the first group? I don't understand. You just hold the microphone very close to your mouth. Sorry. If we have given time, or different hours for different groups. Yes. And one of the group is not keeping the time. Okay. So I'm not able to commit my second timing. Don't understand that bit. Second group, I cannot meet in time. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Because time factor is there. So one group's dependent on the other group. Yes. Yeah, okay. So I'll the first, sort that out. Well, the first, you're, if you're the leader or the manager in that group, it's your job to notice that and to help them catch up, get things done, because there's a commitment to the other group. That's your job as a leader, as a manager. So you have to notice that. You have to keep an eye on it. Keep an eye on the job, keep an eye on the people, keep an eye on the clock. That's the juggling art of management. And that's your job. And if things are not working or things are blocked, things are slowing down, then I have to help my team make decisions or make decisions that will get the blockages out of the way. That's what management's job is. Sorry, I'm talking about the opposition. If someone is not keeping their time with the meeting. And you're in the other group. I'm meeting someone today at 9 p.m. Okay. And turns up at 9.30. Right. So I cannot keep the second group. The second meeting is 10. So I cannot match the, finish my job within that half an hour. Okay. So. Send a messenger, uh, say you'll be late. So. <laughs> I'm delaying the other group also. Yeah, apologies. I've, I'm going to be late for this meeting because I have to, or you have to prioritize. What's more important, finishing the job or being on the meeting? Can you cut the, the job down and do some now and some later? Can you get help to help you with the job so you can get done on time? Many options. Be creative. Be creative. But what kills our creative is, oh, I'm worried, what will they think if I'm late? Oh my goodness, there's anxiety, there's worry in my consciousness. And then I don't think of all the possibilities of ensuring I still get there. Do you see? Yeah. It's good. Not you again. <laughs> yeah, me again. Uh, okay, just adding on to what he was saying. Suppose the groups you are meeting are not people you can control. They're, maybe they are clients, they are important clients. What do you mean suppose that they are not? You can't. Don't even think you can. Yeah. So you can't control them and they, you want to give time to both of them. But um, you can't manage them. You can't tell them, okay, now, sorry, let's, uh, because you are late now, I can't see you. Because uh, he's still giving you business or something. 
So what would you do? But you have to make decisions. You've got decisions to make. Do you send an apology? Do you postpone the meeting? Do you get help? You're the you're the you're the manager. No one's going to tell you what to. You have to work it out. What are my options here? These are the circumstances. What are my options? There's no one right answer. There'll be your answer according to your sense of the context, your sense of who the people are, your sense of what needs to be done, your sense of what your priorities are. All of these factors are unique to you. Only you can decide what to do. But you're right. We ask the question, how to do this, how to do that, how to do this. Where's the manual? Give me the manual. Give me the answer. I don't want to think. I want someone else to do it. No, you're right. This is what the world wants now. This is why everyone asks how to do this and how to do that, how to do this and how to do that. No. Work it out for yourself. Yeah, really. This is called empowerment, self-empowerment. Otherwise, we're on Google all day. <laughs> Correct. That's a good question. Oh, that's a great question. It's good. Anyone else? Now you're scared to ask me any question. <laughs> one, George. one here, one here, yeah. Uh, I want to leave you with a thought. With a thought, okay. Spirituality. Spirituality. Is not in harmony. Is not in harmony. In harmony. With the outside world. With the outside world. You asking me or telling me? I'm telling you. You're telling me. That's fine. Then that, you must be right. <laughs> Lady over here. <laughs> yeah, our question was in regards to the young generation, which is so fast these days. So, I mean, what um, we can't control them, but how can we influence yeah. them to be slower? Yeah. I mean, we can't take them always into the nature. I mean, there must be other day-to-day -day measures. How, I mean... Other uh, day-to-day measures, yeah. Day-to-to-day <laughs> <laughs> -day influences yeah. who, you know, how to, to guide them because I yeah. think it's part of parenting. Yeah, definitely part of parenting. That's the heart. That's why I think parenting is the hardest task in the world today. So if you have children, yeah. Usually when people have children, it's for the wrong reasons too. But anyway, that's another seminar. Uh, I, I, it, I th all, I, all you can do is pass on, you know, is pass on by showing, by demonstrating, not by teaching or fixing or trying to control. This is the big mistake of parents, is trying to fix, because they think I'm the parent, therefore I know better, and, and, and you don't, and if what I say. And, and really the parent is actually saying, um, if you do what I want, then I'll be happy with you. But if you don't do what I want, I'll be unhappy with you. And that's the lesson we all kind of grow up with, and that's fatal. That's what makes us make our happiness dependent on others. So the best lesson for me a parent can teach a child is, is to help them understand that, that, that your happiness as a parent is not dependent on them whatsoever. And, and what happens when you are able to impart, not that verbally, that message, is they become much more open to you. And then when they're more open to you, then you'll have greater influence. They will pick up more from you. So if your rhythm is quieter, is slower, is easier, is less enslaved to the screen, if you like, they'll pick that up and they'll never forget it. But if you're always going, why are you not even listening? Don't, don't be crazy. Don't leave the computer alone. Put it down. Then <laughs> you're in resistance. And guess what? Resistance leads to persistence. So, so it's, no, it's a great question, but it's not an easy one. Definitely. It's a challenge for every parent now. It's good. I think that's enough, eh? Shall we finish with a few moments of tasting the deepest form of time. A moment of meditation and maybe an entry into that timeless inner space of our own consciousness. No music, thank you very much. It's okay. So just relax your body in the chair, step one. Step two is bring your attention to your breath and just watch your breath for a moment. This just helps you to focus your attention on one thing. 
not forcing, just watching. And then bring your awareness to yourself. And see if you can be aware of yourself being aware. And within your awareness, just create one thought. I am a being of peace. Just hold that one thought gently in your mind. And then let it fade away and dissolve into the background. And notice what remains. There's a feeling of peace. So now the mind is quiet. And there's a stillness. Here at the heart of your being. Silent and still. Silent <coughs> and still. And bring your awareness back, back to the room around you, but bring that stillness with you. So as you listen through these ears, hear from that stillness. As you look through these eyes, see from that stillness. Check. In the words of one of those sisters, that was pretty awesome, wasn't it? Yes. So first of all, let's give our appreciation for Mike George. There was a lot of jewels of knowledge there. So one thing that we can do is, if there was a particular point that struck you, practice it. Because we need to try change from theory to practice, because that's when transformation happens, isn't it? One of the things that Mike George said as well is that this is a very valuable resource. This place and the people here are always open for you. 
It's open from 5.30 in the morning to 7.30 in the evening. And you can tap into a lot here. The other thing that he said that was very interesting is it all depends on the self. It's all up to you, isn't it? You're the only person that you have influence over. So we're fortunate because not only do we have two sessions for the price of one, but we have two sessions for no price. So tomorrow, Mike George will also be giving a talk. And tomorrow it shall be how to change your thoughts and change your life. That's, 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 a, that's a pretty big... <laughs> that's pretty awesome too. And uh, that shall be from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. Mike George is also uh, a best-selling author. And we have a selection of his books here. So if you're interested, there is a bookshop downstairs and there's a special table there uh, with Mike George's books. And these, some of these books include Mindsets, Being Yourself, The Immune System of the Soul, Seven Myths About Love, Actually, Don't Get Mad, Get Wise, The Seven Ahas of the Highly Enlightened Souls, Learn to Find Inner Peace, Learn to Relax in the Light of Meditation. So you're all very welcome, and we hope to see you tomorrow as well. Thank you, and have a wonderful evening.